Leading case studies uh, panel. This is going to be chaired by one of our organizers, Steve Davies, from the front lectern here. So I'd just like to invite up, and he'll, he'll introduce everyone uh, when they get up, but um, this is basically lead case studies on the public sector innovation. If you could all come up to the front right now, please. Yep, to the front, jump on the couch. Should be comfortable. And Steve is behind me. OK. Yeah, thank you. OK, when we looked at um, asking people to uh, join, join a panel, uh, really our philosophy was to try and show people real stuff. Now, unless something's gone sadly amiss, we have Carolyn Canham, Department of Human Services. Uh, yes, uh -huh. Judy Harris. Um, Helen Owens. Tim Little. Do we have Tim? Because we seem to have lost him. No. Uh, Monique, hi. And Adam Cowan, hi. Um, so we've got about 13, 14 minutes per, um, per speaker. Uh, the idea is to ask questions at the end. Um, if people are watching from outside, use the hashtag GovStream. The idea is we'll do some, we'll have some interviews next door. And Carolyn, would you mind going first? Okay. Good morning. Um, my name's Carolyn and I work with the Department of Human Services, as you just heard. Um, essentially what I'll be doing is focusing on our work using social media to engage with the youth and students, youth and students audience. Um, first of all, just to give you a bit of background about the department. Um, the Department of Human Services, unlike most government departments, is actually a service delivery department. Um, it combines the former agencies that most Australians um, deal with on a regular basis, for example, Medicare and Centrelink. Um, it also includes child support and Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service. Um, to give you a bit of an idea about the scale of work that we deal with, um, last year, we delivered $90 billion in Centrelink payments and $40 billion in Medicare benefits. Um, those payments include, well, those figures there include a lot of different payments. So we understand that it's really important to communicate with people about not only what types of payments and services are out there for them, but also how they can access them. Like we, can, we understand it's confusing, it's complex, and we essentially want to make it as easy as possible for people to know how to access these services. Um, so we've obviously got a large traditional communications department that works on this, also call centres and customer service centres, but they're always under a lot of pressure. So we've also got a dedicated social media team um, that we use to go out into social media forums and to really try and build relationships with people, um, answer questions, correct misinformation, and really to encourage conversations with people. Um, now, we use social media to contact, to connect with people of all ages. But as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on the youth and students audience because that's the area that I look after. Um, also, I guess we see this area as particularly important because, I mean, you often hear the term um, digital natives bandied around, but um, perhaps overused a little bit. Um, but we do believe that the social media area is somewhere where young people are out having conversations. It's a forum that they're comfortable in. Um, so we want to be out there and be involved with them. Um, we use, oh, sorry, we could just go back for a moment. Um, we use, of course, Facebook and Twitter, those more traditional social media platforms. Um, but we also do, we have a lot of involvement in other forums, and we also sort of do some proactive work of our own. Um, for example, webcasts. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with webcasts, or I'm sure some people are, but um, for those who aren't, essentially what it is is a live interactive event online where we have a panel of experts being filmed, um, answering questions. For example, the first one we held back in March 2010 focused on changes to payments for youth and students. So we had a panel of experts being filmed and at the same and streamed live online. 
Um, and then we had, in the background, moderators sending through questions that had been, some of which had been emailed in previously by the public, um, and others that were coming through as a live chat. Um, and we also had, in addition to the panel of experts, a panel of university students who were also posing their own questions. Um, we had, during the live event, a couple of hundred of people involved, watching online and involved in the live chat, which is not a huge number, but those couple of hundred people were really engaged. Um, for example, initially it was supposed to run for half an hour. It ended up stretching out to an hour because of the demand. And during that hour, we answered an average of two questions per minute. Um, some of those on the panel and some through the live chat. Um, in addition, afterwards, we put the video up online and it became, so the video recording of the webcast became the most viewed video on the Centrelink website with about 20,000 viewers, I believe. So I think we saw this as evidence that this type of online forum is one that really connects with young people. We also, as I mentioned, use um, online forums such as Facebook and Twitter. This is a student update page. Um, it's about 18 months old. This screenshot was taken yesterday. So you can see the 1,600 likes. It's not a huge number, but it's growing really steadily. Um, for example, I've been with the department for about seven months. And over that time, it's 50% growth. It was about 1,100 when I joined, and now it's 1,600. Um, and it's also, it's, it's very interactive. Um, Facebook provides some really handy insights to kind of help us to see how it's used. Um, this is again a screenshot from yesterday that shows the new likes that we've had over the past four weeks. Again, as you can see, it's like it's modest numbers. It's sitting at the four or five per day mark. But again, that's steady and that's been like it's a constant trajectory of growth, which we see as really positive. Um, and it's also mainly organic growth. Most of the people who come to our page, and again, um, Facebook's insights show us this, come from the Department of Human Services website and the Centrelink website. So this is young people who are out there looking for information and seeing that we've got this Facebook offering and thinking that it's relevant to them and them coming to us. Um, this is more of the insights and this shows the age breakdown. Um, I'm not sure if people can see the numbers up the back, but essentially um, that's the, the big, the bulk of um, the, the likes in the middle there. Um, the 40, so it shows that it's 61% of people are in the 18 to 24 bracket um, and an extra 20% are in the 25 years to 34 years age bracket. So this is again telling us that we are really connecting with the audience um, that we're looking to connect with. And now um, one really important thing that we see in terms of our social media offering is that this is not just another avenue for us to send out press releases. This is like, this is a conversation with people. So for example, this is a post that we made back in January telling people or reminding people about the Start Student Startup Scholarship. Um, and as you can see, there's been, or as you might be able to see, that attracted nine comments, which is, um, again, some people just saying that's great news, but other people asking further questions. For example, someone saying, when will this be paid? Um, and this was, what, and so of course, then we jumped back on with that information. And this is another example of, I guess, where this provides value to our business. Um, for example, through social media in this instance, we worked out that there was nowhere on our website that told people when this payment was going to be made. And so that lack of information could potentially cause a lot of extra traffic to our call centres and customer service centres, a lot of extra pressure on our business. So we see it as a really valuable opportunity to identify issues and address them. Um, now, in addition to obviously sending out information, on Facebook we also allow people to post on our walls. Um, there's an option not to allow this, and a lot of organisations don't, um, but we see it again as just a really important way to connect with people and to allow conversation. So this is just an example of where someone's asked a question, we've answered it, and then got a positive reply. Um, and again, where we see this as adding extra value is it's not just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or it is, but it's in a public sphere. So 
potentially it's not just this person who's getting this information. It's many, many other people. Um, and issues like this allowable time, for instance, it is, it's quite a confusing issue. So we see it's really important for us to be going out there and explaining it to people. Um, now, and of course, when it comes to posts on page, as I mentioned, a lot of organisations don't allow it um, because there are risks, obviously. Um, for example, there's risks, particularly in our, um, in our area, that people will share private information um, and also potentially share other people's private information. Um, there's also risks of people posting abusive information, um, also risks of breach of spam or breaches of copyright. And we address this through a number of ways. For example, we always, we've got a close relationship with our legal department and work with them. We don't just work in a silo. Um, we've got very, very strict, very comprehensive guidelines on like acceptable use of our pages. We also, um, as I mentioned, we've got a dedica dedicated social media team who are trained in how to moderate pages. Um, and we actually, we received training from the Australian government solicitor. So we all, and we've got very strict procedures in place, in place to, to deal with all of these risks. Um, we've also got, in terms of responses, um, a very strict clearance process. Um, so for example, if we're sharing information as an answer that's already out in the public sphere, for example, we're just directing people back to our website, we've got an internal clearing process within our team. However, if we're releasing new information which is not publicly available, then we clear it through the business team. We've also got a spreadsheet of pre-cleared answers that we've used previously and had cleared previously so that we're not drawing on the business team's time more than necessary. Um, this is just another shot. So in addition to Facebook and Twitter, we're also really active in a number of forums. Um, for example, Yahoo Answers and Whirlpool. Whirlpool, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but I had a look on Google Insights yesterday, and in April this year, there were 700,000 unique visitors from Australia. So again, this is a forum that a lot of young people are visiting. Um, and so we go in there regularly. We've got a presence on there where we go and we essentially just answer people's questions. Um, same with Yahoo Answers. This is an example of kind of the standard question we get. This person saying they're 16, go to school full time, live with grandparents who are on a pension and his parents are split up. Um, he essentially wants to know if he's eligible for youth allowance, but he's also worried that like, he doesn't want to get it if he thinks it's going to affect his grandparents' pensions. So this is a young person out there with a legitimate question, and again, using social media, using the forums that he's familiar with and comfortable with. Um, so we think that's providing a lot of value, us being out there and providing this information. Um, and we also, we use judgment too. Like we work out where we can add value. A lot of times people are on, just on Yahoo Answers and they clearly know that they're not eligible but they want advice on how they can get around the system and stuff like that. So we, you know, we're selective, we use judgment. And um, as I said, we, we talk amongst our team. Like we, we don't work in a silo, we work together to, in difficult situations. Um, we also, um, as a way to sort of track what's happening out in the world of social media. We've actually got a partnership with the CSIRO where we've developed this social media monitoring tool called Visi. Um, and it goes, it scans the web and tracks mentions of various issues that relate to us. Um, and then obviously we use that to then go back and add value when we can. So now, just in conclusion, um, overwhelmingly, we find that people are surprised and pleased that we're out there in forums. Occasionally we get people questioning whether it's, there's a big brother element to it. Um, but actually not as, not as often as I would expect. Um, overwhelmingly people just want to get the information. They just want to know what payments and services they're eligible for and how to do it. Um, so we think that's really positive. Um, other positives again, as I mentioned earlier, are um, identifying issues early 
and fixing them, which we hope relieves um, pressure on our call centres and customer service centres. We're actually working with various business teams to try and work out a way to track that, um, to hopefully show evidence that we are actually um, making a difference in regards to those business processes. Um, and this is, this is tricky and it's a work in process, but we're pretty confident that as our presence out there grows, um, we'll be able to show evidence of that. So thank you very much. Um, I believe there might be time for questions afterwards. Helen Owens. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak uh, at GovCamp. Um, I'm the general manager of the Office of Spatial Policy, which um, the information commissioner mentioned uh, in his talk earlier this morning. Um, I've been in that role only four months, uh, started in January and I'm still getting my head around uh, what it is that we are supposed to be achieving. Um, but what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is some of the activities that the office is undertaking and how that might actually link to some of the issues that you're working through. And the presentation I've, I've called Location Innovation. Um, one of the things about government information is that there is one single piece of consistency and that is location. Everything happens at a point on the earth and uh, we, we think that the spatial information infrastructure is the way of linking and networking all of the Australian government data. Uh, there's a few drivers around um, the setup of the Office of Spatial Policy. There was a strategic review into Geoscience Australia. Uh, Dr Vanessa Lawrence from UK Ordnance uh, came out to undertake a study of spatial capability in Australia and that has been released on our website. And there was also a, an APS 200 locations uh, committee that uh, undertook a project to have a look at spatial capability across the Commonwealth. Um, spatial accounting is something that the current government has uh, mandated uh, to certain agencies. At this stage, spatial accounting is in its infancy and uh, my office is uh, very focused in particular on that, um, on that issue. Um, and of course we have uh, the Australia and New Zealand uh, Spatial Information Council, which is a group of jurisdictional uh, members who come together on a quarterly basis to discuss spatial matters. So the APS 200 location project report basically came up with some principles around um, the sharing of spatial data in Australia. Um, we are looking at all of these things at the moment, governance arrangements, foundational data. Our secretary, Drew Clark, will be here this afternoon and he will go into more detail about those foundational data sets that we're working on. Uh, we're looking at, well, so if there are foundational data sets, who are the stewards, who are the custodians, so that we can ensure that the data sets are authoritative. Standards uh, and interoperability are uh, vitally important and, uh, of course, the licensing arrangements around uh, creative commons and access to the data. Thanks, Jeff. So in terms of the governance, we have a steering committee which is chaired by our secretary and uh, there are a number of uh, Bantus across the Commonwealth who sit on that committee and the, the key element that we are working on right now is a whole of Commonwealth uh, licence to the geocoded national address framework. Um, we call that the GNAF because we love acronyms in the spatial world. Um, so the GNAF is a product uh, produced by the Public Sector Mapping Agency, uh, PSMA Australia which is a limited company that is owned by all of the jurisdictions across Australia, um, including the Commonwealth. Um, we are seeking to negotiate with them a whole of government licence so that every agency can embed the geocoded national address framework into their business processes. And importantly, um, that is how uh, agencies will ultimately spatially account 
um, their expenditure, they can spatially enable all of their information and data. Um, and it's a, it's a key piece of work that we're very focused on at the moment. Uh, the framework data themes, I'm not going to go into these in great detail because Drew will cover it off this afternoon um, in the panel session. But just to give you a snapshot, these are the foundational data sets that we are creating, building for uh, common use across the Commonwealth and the states. Um, and there's a significant amount of effort going in um, across uh, all of the jurisdictions in pulling all of these data sets together. Ultimately, uh, they will be published um, and we are seeking open access for all of these data sets. So we've got a couple of challenges here in the spatial world. Um, the other part of my job is looking at what is an Australian spatial data infrastructure and how does that hang together? What does it look like? We have uh, uh, the Office of Spatial Policy is basically taking the lead on that and it will take a significant amount of reform. So, oh, that changed. That says um, invent and adapt. Um, yes, well, um, so some of these might. <laughs> um, the pro one of the problems in Australia is that um, what we've notoriously done in the spatial game is actually uh, invent new systems in a stovepipe fashion um, without reference to a standard business architecture. And ultimately what that leads to is silos um, of capability. So uh, we need to actually um, turn that on its head and actually adopt what's already out there. So across the jurisdictions, across the Commonwealth, uh, in CSIRO, in the e-research community, there are multiple instances of spatial data infrastructures. And what we're seeking to do in OSP is actually join those and link those together to create a, a national capability. Because this is what it ends up like if, uh, if you just stand up an infrastructure without reference to a standardised business architecture. And uh, unfortunately, this is where we're at at the moment. Um, and it, I think it's a, a, a good depiction of where we, where we don't want to be. Next one. Um, in the spatial game as well, what we've, uh, what we've done is create data and try to communicate it out. Um, and without reference really to what the user really needs and also without standard. Uh, spatial data standards are vitally important and uh, our office is responsible for all of the spatial data uh, standards across Australia and we negotiate across uh, the globe, in fact, internationally on uh, spatial data standards. Um, so again, we need to flip this over and uh, actually um, do far more of the standardisation before we actually then um, communicate our data out there. Um, we talk about architecture versus infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, notoriously what, uh, what agencies will do is stand up a, an infrastructure without reference to the architecture. And again, we must uh, turn that on its head in this reform process. And uh, there's a, a range of activities that the office um, is involved in. So, oh, one more, please, Jeff. Um, so what, what we're ultimately looking at uh, here in a spatial data infrastructure is linked information across multiple governments. Um, I'll give one example perhaps, which is a really good example, is the Australian Business Register. So the Australian Business Register is seeking to uh, geocode, and that means uh, latitude and longitude of that business, and uh, distribute that to all of the uh, local and state governments, uh, about a thousand agencies um, across Australia. That information is vitally important for urban planning, emergency management, policy decisions, um, and service delivery, um, government service delivery. So I'm not expecting you to understand this diagram. All it says is there is 
massive amount of information out there created by government. And um, as I mentioned, the single linchpin really is that they are all linked by location. So a linked and unified spatial data infrastructure does not mean centralised data. Everyone will have their data in their location but it does mean a very open, collaborative approach um, which we are working towards uh, with the Australia New Zealand Land Information Council um, and, uh, and through the APS Steering Committee. So just in closing then, um, we see that uh, giving access to the geocoded national address file and the uh, fundamental spatial data themes um, across the Commonwealth and the states is uh, in our interests, in all of our interests. Um, and it will allow us ultimately to work towards linking um, all of our data, environmental, social, um, and, uh, and the list goes on. Um, and ultimately for government, it will um, underpin economic prosperity um, because we can manage um, the, um, the issues that we need to deal with in government much better using location as a basis for that. Thank you. Uh, Adam Cowan, uh, Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations. I've got no idea what you do, so... <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, it was good to hear that you've got no idea what I do, because uh, this is what I'm about to let you know. And I suppose there's a bit of a difference between my presentation and what we've heard so far this morning in that um, there's not really a technical element to my presentation. So I work in the um, social innovation group, and so really this is about innovations within the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations that have a social policy innovation perspective. Um, so within that, uh, I really want to talk about one particular program, the Social Enterprise Development and Investment Funds, which my team has implemented, but give you a little bit of context for the work that we do within Social Innovation Group. Now, it's just a snapshot. I know we've only got a short amount of time. Um, so I really invite you to go and visit our website and have a look at uh, what other things that we might do within the Social Innovation Group and feel free to contact me um, afterwards if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Now I'm really lucky to be part of this group because we come into work every day thinking about how we can think differently about the work that government does. Um, it's very challenging at times because we don't have a path before us, we come up against a lot of brick walls but we also have some really exciting times and the CEDIF uh, was one of those. So maybe before I go into the CEDIF too much, just to a little bit about the social innovation branch. There's probably three key areas that we work on. Uh, the first one's around community asset building. So what is it that we can do innovatively, innovatively that, that helps build um, assets within the community that help support the community and work towards what it is that communities hope government can provide for them or help them to achieve themselves. And I suppose one of those programs that we're working on at the moment um, is a children's ground program, which really is around looking at innovative approaches to um, early education and um, the way in which disadvantaged kids and their families can help get a better outcome by having a much more engaged approach. Um, that's actually spun off a company from the work that we've done, and that company now is out there seeking investment from private investors, philanthropists, to um, place this model in uh, a locationally disadvantaged area to help uh, a new approach to getting better education outcomes. Uh, we also lead dialogue um, and action around social innovation and, and run a number of uh, different things, including a, a GovDEX platform for state and territory governments and the Commonwealth Government focused around building a social investment market in Australia. Uh, but recently, Minister Shorten also released a, a paper which was around uh, place-based impact initiatives and how you can target investment into areas of disadvantage, which can help, again, grow communities. Um, and that was a partnership with uh, NAB, JB Weir and Mission Australia. So that was a really important piece of work that helped work across a range of sectors to come up with some really innovative approaches, which give a map to 
uh, others to take that idea forward and, and implement their uh, particular program. So our work is not necessarily about only what government can do, but about creating maps and opportunities for others to then think about how they might apply that thinking to a particular program design. Uh, and then the third piece of work, which is kind of the, the, the majority of the work that we're doing at the moment is around access to capital uh, for social purpose. So how can we increase the amount of funding that's available to get better social uh, policy outcomes that's not necessarily reliant on government funding alone? Uh, and the CEDIF, the Social Enterprise Development Investment Fund, is our first demonstration project in that area. Uh, but maybe just to, before I get stuck into the CEDIF, um, just a little bit about the authorising environment for why, um, you know, why would a, a small group within the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations be building a social investment market? Um, it's, you know, that's a question I often get asked by my friends at parties and, and, and talk to them about, well, don't you do education or don't you do employment or workplace relations and why are you doing something that's sort of stuck over on the side there? Well, there are really um, three reasons that we focus on, and, and these are reasons for innovation generally, but there are a number of others, but these are probably the main ones for us. And the, the first one is really around addressing complex problems. Um, as a large social policy organisation, uh, we know that, there, um, that government uh, programs aren't always right, don't always achieve what they're meant to achieve, and that um, social policy uh, problems are quite complex and not necessarily addressed by any particular action. So we're looking at ways in which we can take a, a much broader view of, of getting to a particular outcome rather than thinking about addressing particular symptoms. Um, in two areas that we focus on in particular are social inclusion, inclusion and some Indigenous policy issues that we're dealing with within our group. Um, the second one is really around fiscal pressures and doing more with less. Um, as, a, as a department that has a, quite a large budget and a, a quite a broad variety of programs that we deliver, we know that uh, the, and as do every other, as does every other department in the room here, the fiscal pressures that we're under at the moment, um, that uh, th you know, there are very few spending proposals, that the future um, complexity of social policy issues aren't going to reduce the fiscal pressures on government. We know the impact of an ageing population uh, and we know that if we don't find better ways of delivering government services and finding ways to address social policy outcomes uh, that we will struggle to meet the costs of delivering that uh, through government in the way that we've done it in the past. And um, the third part, uh, the third real um, authorising environment for us or driver of the work that we do is uh, raising public expectations regarding service delivery. Uh, so we're very conscious of the role that uh, communities and other sector players uh, can have and fulfil in helping us develop and design better social policy outcomes. And so all of our work really um, engages with a, a broad cross-sector um, approach. So maybe then getting specifically onto the CEDIF. Um, essentially, these are the first social enterprise development investment funds in Australia. So the first funds that help provide access to capital for social enterprises. Uh, and for social enterprises, I mean organisations that have, uh, as a measure of their activities, some element of social return, but also they trade to fulfil their mission. So they're not just a not-for-profit that might operate as a charity, that operates uh, purely on grants, but that they deliver services in some way that generate some sort of a revenue. So an issue that we've had in the past is that many of these organisations have relied on grant funding, uh, to live day by day and what that does is stifle innovation for them because they have to, there's no certainty about their funding and much of their time is spent looking for additional funding uh, and they can't plan long term because they don't have a long term um, financial security. So we've uh, developed these uh, investment funds and, and really uh, an innovation there was first in attracting matching uh, capital. So. Uh, we provided $20 million, which was matched by $20 million of private investment. Um, they are the first social investment funds and really are a way to kickstart the social investment uh, economy in Australia. The other element of the funds is really a, a paradigm shift that we're trying to 
um, help elaborate on for investors that um, we've had a split in the past between philanthropists who give money and um, uh, you know, at, at one end and corporate investors at the other who are looking for a high financial return on their investment. What we're saying through social investment and what the evidence is, is demonstrating to us and what the approaches are that we're encouraging is for investors to understand that good outcomes can achieve both a social and financial return and it's not just one or the other. And the CEDIF is giving us an opportunity uh, to test that. So apart from looking at an alternative financing mechanism to help uh, support a particular Australian government policy outcome, it's also building a market in social investment. Um, so it's not, not a thing government often does, go out there and build a market or intervene in a market, uh, but in this case uh, we've made that decision based on uh, you know, some of the um, drivers I've indicated earlier. So if that's a, a fund, and there are, there are two fund managers that have been announced and another one uh, to be announced shortly, um, there are funds out there, so they're not so innovative. It's, it's innovative because it's slightly different in that it's taking a social um, policy approach. And uh, so what is it about what we did um, that drives down into a bit more of, of the innovation that uh, was ever in our particular approach? I guess I can break it down into two areas. Um, the first one really was around the, the design of the CEDIF and I don't know how much experience you've had in grant programs but there's quite a lot of um, rigour around providing guidelines that are quite specific and uh, which help guide the, the procurement decision about the allocation of that grant. We decided to take a, a really big risk by leaving that quite open. Um, so we were very non-prescriptive in our grant guidelines. Now, we had quite detailed and complex grant guidelines, but they were non-prescriptive. So that enabled organisations to come to us with their ideas on how they thought the funds would work. Um, now that, that creates a, a double-edged sword. Uh, you get a wide variety of applications, but you also then have a difficulty of comparing apples with oranges. So in order to ensure that we manage that risk, so one, we accept the risk and we deal with that, but in order to manage that risk, we had a very comprehensive assessment guide that was informed by um, state, stakeholder communication and collaboration earlier, but also a, a literature review and access to experts in social investment that could help guide that process once we receive the, the applications. Um, so that worked out really well for us and, and we were quite surprised with the variety of applications that we got, uh, ranging from venture capital type approaches, uh, you know, to place-based regional um, collaborations that we probably didn't think were, were at, you know, at the stage where they might be ready. Um, so it was really a, a, an excellent process for us and a good sense of where um, some of the hidden gems within the market were located. The um, second thing we did uh, within the grant program was we threw out the standard funding agreement. Um, so we didn't even try and adjust and amend the existing DEWA funding agreement. Um, we, we completely threw it out because we were doing something innovative and we knew that the, the funding agreement would scare fund managers that were applying for the funds uh, to manage these funds, that uh, the funding agreement would not be familiar to the types of organisations that would be applying. So we threw it out, we started from scratch, we pulled out all of the, the bits that we needed for legal reasons and we essentially engaged some experts, some uh, some external lawyers with financial services experience to draft us a concept draft of a new funding agreement. Uh, and with that concept draft, we provided that to the shortlisted applicants so that they knew early on what they were getting themselves into, but we also presented it to them as a concept draft and our engagement and negotiation with them actually shaped the funding agreements that uh, we ended up, ended up with. And the funding agreements that we have for the different fund managers are different because they reflect the, those particular funds. So that was a really different way to manage a grant program. Um, it, it was a lot of work. Uh, we're very conscious that um, it's a, a prime example of a, of a grant program to be audited by the ANAO. So we had uh, some very um, intense record keeping and all of the decisions where we departed from the norm, which was very often on a daily basis, were all documented um, and explained. We, we had some great products that came out of that. Uh, the concept draft, for example, um, you know, is a very expensive document and will save other departments and organisations 
um, lots of money because they don't have to go through that process of developing it. So we're able to make these available uh, to others um, through our GovDEX network and, and other networks. So while that was around the design of the actual uh, and, and implementation of the, of the grant process itself, um, the demonstration effect of the CDF is also a, a great uh, innovation for us. And so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about what we're hoping to achieve. So I've mentioned that it's testing the social investment market. Um, there are a range of other activities happening across government, uh, not just in Australia, but in states and territories, which are looking at social investment as an alternative financing mechanism. And what we have now is a, you know, a laboratory. So we've, we've, we've got three funds out there and we can actually test and see um, such things as you know, what the investor appetite is, what the investment readiness of community organisations is. Um, some of the lessons that we will be learning through this CEDAF will help inform the development of, of other approaches that other governments might make as well as our own. Um, there's a development of innovative financial products and financing mechanisms for social enterprises. So one of the problems about having access to capital, apart from not having a um, uh, sound financial footing for social enterprises was actually the types of products that they need weren't really being delivered by traditional financing institutions such as banks or credit unions. So the, the fund managers are able to work with them to develop new products. Um, an important part of, of the, the fund managers' responsibilities is the development of social impact measurement frameworks. And anyone who's worked in a social policy delivery agency knows the difficulty in measuring the actual impact of the funding for the particular programs. Uh, so uh, the testing of particular approaches and frameworks through these fund managers and the organisations they fund will help give us evidence to then share with other governments about approaches at work. Um, it's also helped facilitate connections. So a lot of the market building work in, in developing the social investment market and developing the seat of funds has been in collaboration with a range of um, financial sector, players as well as community sector organisations and not-for-profit sector, um, high net worth individuals and other government departments and those conversations across sectors are really important in helping to develop that market. Um, the development of intermediary organisations that have a, a brokering capacity. So governments still, um, you know, we may still be able to develop a program and we may still identify a need but much of the action happens uh, at a point where brokering those deals is really important and it's not necessarily a role that governments played in the past. Um, but being able to empower other organisations to be able to do that, give them the tools and some experience and opportunities through such things as the CDF um, is going to be instrumental in, in helping the market shift forward. Um, the enabling innovative service delivery is really about giving social enterprises that firm of financial footing so they don't have to think about tomorrow's source of funds but can think longer term about trying uh, innovative products. And, in accessing capital and, and blending different types of um, uh, finance that they might receive, they will have different motivations for being able to look at innovative approaches to service delivery. So it won't always be about what the, the grant, the traditional grant that they've received tells them to do, uh, but about working towards an outcome based on the, on the money that, and the freedom that that finance has given them to be able to do that. Um, and then the final one there is really around greater social impact. So if we're enabling community organisations who are closer to the social policy problems that we're trying to address, um, if we're empowering them to be able to, to take different approaches, then we're hoping that we will have greater social impact through that, but also in being able to measure that social impact through the development of impact measurement frameworks. So that's really it in a nutshell. Um, I haven't focused on the technology side of things, but the technology side of things uh, is really important. and. Um, Helen's comment about the, the architecture and infrastructure are really important for us as well. So this work is really about um, developing the infrastructure for social investment uh, market in Australia. But in order to develop that infrastructure, we've really been collaborating with a range of other sectors to develop that architecture. Um, so uh, maybe just in, in sort of finalising, uh, the technology side of things is really important. And we do have a, a GovDEX platform, as I've mentioned previously. We've used a Creative Commons license on some of the um, products that we've developed through this process and more of the products that we're developing. We're working towards a compendium which will 
provide um, case studies and examples of the different types of social investment approaches that we've taken. The CEDAP will be one of those, place-based investment will be another, uh, and we're working on some, some other things, including social impact bonds. Um, and really the, the importance of sharing this information with others who are involved in uh, the development of the social investment market. So a little bit different to the technical side of things, but really exciting from a social policy perspective and being able to think differently about the work that we do. But thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was a brief case study of a large online education portal, which we're in the process of building with Education Services Australia. And what I wanted to talk about, I guess, was the uh, process of developing the ideas and concepts that went in to form this project. Um, this project was formally announced uh, last year by Ministers Garrett and Conroy. Uh, it's been funded for $19.4 over three years. Uh, it's a very exciting project for the ABC on many levels and I think it really demonstrates some of the changes in thinking at the ABC which align with the sort of Gov 2.0 principles. Uh, so principles such as opening up collections, sharing data, collaborating and digital innovation. Uh, so this project had quite a long gestation within the um, strategic development group at ABC Innovation. Uh, and I wanted to talk through some of the research and pilot work that we did, uh, as well as give you a bit of an overview of the project itself and what we hope to achieve with it. And lastly, I'll just uh, touch briefly on lessons we've learnt along the way and some of the challenges to innovation uh, at somewhere like the ABC. Um, so for some time, um, my colleagues and I within the strategic development group at the ABC, including Chris Winter, who's here today, have been interested in ways of trying to open up the ABC archives and making it more available online for the Australian public. Uh, we were inspired by similar moves by public broadcasters overseas and also by the Gov 2.0 agenda. In 2009, the BBC had been doing some experiments with opening up its archives for creative use, and we'd been in contact with a guy called Tony Aggie there, who was involved uh, with this at the BBC. He made a great speech in 2009 titled Digital Treasures, where he talked about the, arc the BBC archives not as individual gold nuggets or rare gemstones, but more as a vast seam of coal that could provide raw fuel for the digital rev revolution. We also watched with envy as the powerhouse released some of their wonderful photographic collection onto Flickr Commons. At this time, within the strategic development team, um, inspired by Google, we had 20% uh, time. Uh, so this is where you'd be able to spend one day a week or 20% of your time developing ideas and projects uh, that you felt were, had sort of potential for, for the ABC. Uh, my 20% time project was ABC Open Archives. And what we did was we managed to sort of cobble together enough time and support to put 100 uh, images from the ABC photographic archives up on Flickr, also on ABC Pool, um, and we published them under Creative Commons licences. We also syndicated them to the National Library Trove Collection. Um, so I just wanted to show you a, a sample of some of these beautiful photographs that we unearthed as, as part of that project. So the ABC has quite a vast um, digital archive now. We have about 30,000 hours of TV digitised, 80,000 hours of radio and 7,000 photos, and they stretch from 1932 to the present day. And we feel there's a great potential there, uh, particularly in terms of Australian cultural and history um, for providing these to the public online. Uh, this project, um, which is a more recent one, um, which is also using the ABC archives called 80 Days That Changed Our Lives, um, has created a curated collection of moments in Australian history that have affected the Australian psyche. 
And then we asked people to go online and vote for um, the days that they thought have most changed our lives. Um, as a bit of a first for, bro uh, for broadcasters in Australia, we published a selection of these clips to Wikimedia Commons and Wikipedia with some help from Liam Wyatt and Wikimedia Australia. Um, so this clip in particular um, was a bit of a viral hit. Um, it was an interview with Arthur C. Clarke in 1974 where he predicted that by 2001 every household would have a computer and be connected all over the world. Um, at the same time as we were doing these archives pilots, we were also doing a number of education pilots. Um, so we wanted to look at how we could um, make short form ABC content more usable and valuable for educational audiences. Um, we did one pilot with the Centre for Learning Innovation in the New South Wales Department of Education and Training and one with Education Services Australia. Uh, so this project we did with um, the Centre for Learning Innovation, we were interested to explore how we could make uh, short form secondary science content uh, more available for teachers and align it directly with the curriculum uh, so that it would be searchable by teachers by, sub by subject, year level and keywords. Um, so the model we used for this was one of um, sharing metadata. The ABC wrote the broadcast metadata um, and then passed it on to CLI who um, wrote the educational metadata. Um, and then we shared that metadata across both of our websites. So we put this site up on ABC Science Online um, so teachers could search for content. And we also syndicated it to TAIL, which is their teacher resource repository. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a collaboration in, in that sense. Uh, the second education pilot we did was with Education Services Australia, uh, formerly the Learning Federation. For this project, um, the ESA were interested in sourcing some of that archival content um, and making it available for teachers, uh, Australian teachers, via their Scootle database and other state-based intranets. So again, using a, a similar model of sharing metadata and distribution, um, we came up with to, uh, with a number of collections around um, science and history material um, and published them both on the ABC site and then syndicated the content to um, ESA for their systems. This is just an example of um, one of the clips that were up there. Um, so at the same time as doing the pilots, um, we were undertaking research into best practice in online education and learning. Um, we found that students and teachers were using a lot of online media um, and that they were sourcing a lot of their material from the US and the UK, but they were having problems finding really good quality Australian content to use in the classrooms. Um, we found they were using ABC content, but they, that they found it hard to locate and also unreliable. Um, so they met when they, they didn't know if they went back there next time whether the content would be there. Uh, we also found that um, education is becoming increasingly socially based, untethered and digitally rich. Um, so I guess um, there were a few ideas that were aligning um, for us as we were doing this research and pilot work. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so these um, ideas were, I guess, open data and op opening up the archives. Um, secondly, the Australian National Curriculum. And lastly, the MBN and the new opportunities there for rich data environments and also synchronous collaboration. Uh, so the proposal for the education portal built on a lot of these ideas and research and concepts. Um, what we are going to do is build a rich library of ABC content um, uh, which will have, um, so sort of, there'll be quite a lot of video content, so three to five minute clips, um, as well as audio and infographics and interactives. Um, the library will be, the content in the library will be directly aligned to the Australian National Curriculum, and there'll also be a suite of tools and services that surround the library to enable people to use that in more creative ways. For, so, for example, uh, remixing tools, playlist tools, that sort of thing. We'll also have some modules around um, current affairs and contemporary content, 
um, that are in line with things that are emerging um, within the Australian current affairs environment. Uh, the library will have a thousand clips from the ABC archives sourced over three years and 250 hours of segmented contemporary content. The metadata from the library will be syndicated to Scootal and other state-based uh, in education intranets as well as available via RSS and an API for other partners to access the collection information. The second main part of this project is to build um, new interactive learning resources um, and particularly targeting students and families in the home. So what we want to So what we want to explore, I guess, is the potential of the MBN for making learning a fun and exploratory learning environment. Um, so we'll be building things such as um, immersive 3D environments, multiplayer games, and video conferences with ABC personalities. Some of these projects will build internally at the ABC and others will be developed um, in collaboration with other organisations and others will be commissioned from the digital sector. So lastly, I just wanted to mention, I guess, um, a couple of things that we've learnt along the way and, and some of the challenges that we find. Uh, so I guess from, from this case study, you can see um, that within strategic development, because we didn't have a, a large budget, in fact, a very small budget, uh, we focused very much on sort of pilot projects. Um, so we found it easier to get things up and running and also to get buy-in from different parts of the ABC and running them as pilots. Um, secondly, to find partners and champions um, within the organisation, but also um, in other organisations to support the project. And thirdly, looking for trends that are converging over time. In terms of challenges, um, people often assume that the ABC is one organisation and are surprised to find that it's actually five masquerading as one. Um, but seriously, um, the, wall, uh, the walls between the silos are slowly becoming more permeable. Uh, but it's still very challenging to um, innovate in a project like this across silos. Um, we've also discovered that with a project like this, which is a large project on a very tight deadline, it's actually quite hard to spend money at the ABC. Um, I think we're so used to not having any um, that it, there are really a lot of processes in place and a lot of hurdles to jump. And probably we spend as much time um, going through those processes and jumping those hurdles as we do actually putting the project together. And lastly, uh, I guess just that having the space to be able to do pure R&D. Um, within strategic development, we had to come up with ideas that were not only innovative and cutting edge, but also that were able to reach um, significant audiences. And I think um, in that sense, there is hard, it's hard to do real R&D um, without having any product outcomes or, or metrics. Uh, so, um, so I hope this case study has given you a bit of insight into the processes and approach to innovation and Gov 2.0 at the ABC. Uh, the education portal will be launched later this year um, with a big public launch at the beginning of the 2013 school year. So keep your eyes out. Thanks. Um, I'm actually going to introduce our next uh, panellist who were added late to the panel. So over the weekend, uh, I mentioned GovHack at the beginning of the day, a whole bunch of developers in Sydney and Canberra doing stuff. We thought it would be wonderful to, um, to demonstrate some of that stuff to you. So we've got stuff happening in the showcase room on the main screen, but we've also invited our youngest team from GovHack, which was um, teacher Matthew and student Lockie. Um, they did, in 48 hours, they worked with Bureau of Meteorology Data to do their project 100 years. Now, do you want to speak up here? That'll be perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, could Lockie get a hand mic? That'd be great. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, hey, everyone. My name's um, Matthew Purcell. I'm a teacher at Canberra Grammar School. And my partner in crime over here is Lockie Ferrier. And I teach, one of the subjects I teach is Year 10 iPhone and iPad application development. And a few weeks ago, we saw that there was a um, competition called GovHack. So we thought, oh, 48 hour hackathon, we'll uh, have a shot at that. So we entered 
And over the weekend, Lockie and I um, wrote an application called 100 Years, which uses open government data. It uses the past 100 years of temperature and rainfall data um, from the Bureau of Meteorology. And we we're really, really, um, we we're really, really impressed with how we could use this open government data to actually create something which would be useful for people in interpreting this data. And over the weekend, we learned a lot of things as well. We, we learned about, of course, open government data. We learned a lot about development. Uh, we also learned how uncomfortable those couches are to sleep on overnight, um, but they're still more comfortable than the floor. Um, and Lockie, I'll pass over to you to have a bit of a chat about what you learned over the weekend. Um, yeah, so we'll go into the demo of 100 years. So it's a fully iPad application we wrote from scratch um, using Xcodes and um, Objective-C, so the, the native language for it. Uh, Lockie did most of it and he's going to demo it to you now. It was originally intended to be 100 years, but due to performance issues, it's only 2011 data. Um, so we can go in between days, see a bit of a shift. We can also maybe see rainfall data, see some storms moving around Australia. Um, we can go to a winter date and look at the minimum temperature for Australia, very cold, um, particularly down in Canberra. Um, <laughs> Yep, and so, and then say if we went to summer and went back to maximum temperature, you can see the country is very hot. So you can see lots of different climate stuff. Um, there's of course the graph down the bottom, um, which you can use to zoom in and get some closer data if that's what you're really after. That's an average for the entire nation. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much the, the general summary of it. You can show those three different types of data on a very interactive map for all 365 days in 2011, and we thought that important it out. So, yeah, that's Thank you, Lucky. So, oh, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> um, so Lockie actually did a quite a few modifications to that application last night in preparation for today um, in lieu of his Romeo and Juliet assignment due tomorrow. So, <laughs> good work. Glad to see the priorities are in order. Um, Regarding also GovHack itself, it was absolutely um, fantastic experience and we really do appreciate the um, effort that went into the organising the event by um, Pierre and Jeff and all the GovHack team. Just being able to, if nothing else, also network with all the data set mentors, talk to them about how the data can be used, talk to them about how the data uh, can be integrated into applications was amazing. And I think a rewarding part of it for both of us um, was that at the end when we could see the presentation just seeing how people came up with all these ideas because we met every single lunchtime at school last week trying to figure out what we were going to do we were looking at the data sets and going how are we going to sort of use this stuff and we eventually came up with the idea for 100 years but um, just being able to see the innovative ideas that everyone else came up with as well was uh, really interesting because it's sort of things that we would never have considered in the world, but now um, when we do GovHack again next year, which I hope it does run again next year, um, we'll have a lot more foundation in sort of those um, app ideas. So Lockie and I will be sticking around afterwards to answer any questions that you have before we head back to school. So please feel free to come and chat to us. Um, we'd of course love to chat to you as well about um, any sort of data sets you have or any way that we could possibly get involved with what you're doing um, as a school. So thank you very much. Last but not least, uh, Julie Harris from the Australian Bureau of Stats uh, with a topic dear to my heart, I think. We'll just wait for the technology to catch up. We've had a bit of fun with it this morning, so rather than delivering PowerPoint, you will be getting death by PDF. Um, I'm here to talk about ABS Betaworks. It's, uh, something that's been running for a few years and we're hoping that it will help us meet the needs of future data users, but we need your help to do that. But I'll give you a bit of background in the meantime. Okay, skip us that one. <laughs> so effectively our mission, when it comes up, if you want to skip through, 
Is it going? Yes, cool. All right, so this is our mission. Um, basically, the key part of that is informed decision making. We collect the data, we collect a hell of a lot of data. There's a lot of it on our website. Um, we know it's there somewhere, we need to help you find it. Um, but we need to make sure that you can find it so you can make the informed decisions, whether it be policy makers or if you're going to make a decision on where to live or where to open a business. Um, next one. So our vision is to communicate information that's clear, understandable, um, suitable, convenient. We know that we miss the mark a bit at this point in time. Um, we've gotten that feedback quite a lot. Um, so what we want to do is make it accessible, impartial, and have plenty of supporting metadata and guidance for you. So our, obviously, primary access to ABS data is through the ABS website. Prior to 2005, all of our data was released in um, PDF publication. You had to pay to access it and download it. Now it's free, anyone can have it. It is also released under Creative Commons, so you can use it for whatever you like, as long as um, cred credit is attributed back to us. Um, we also have the um, proviso that you make the decisions based on your use of the data. You know, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. So, <laughs> um, The majority of our calls are to our help desk are about accessing the ABS website, so we know it can be difficult to get around. Um, so that's where my team tries to come in and help. Um, and we also know that one third of accesses to our website come through search engines. So um, we can't rely on our homepage as a sole entry point anymore. Uh, only 20, less than 22% of our users come through the homepage. Next one. Um, so yeah, obviously we've got a lot of new tools that are cheap, powerful, easy to learn, and we can share information easily. And our, um, our web presence is no longer defined by our primary website, so we need to be visible and device agnostic. Um, obviously, why we're here today, Gov 2.0 is open, speedy and inexpensive access. Um, it's an inherent right of us as dumb Australians. Next one. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, a term we picked up from the Italians, the prosumer. Um, it's no longer a consumer where you're just being fed information, you're consuming it. This is an, uh, an opportunity for uh, Gov 2 to provide you the opportunity to provide information. Um, to provide new perspectives, to provide new stories around what the information we're collecting is, is giving you. Okay, and of course there's the wicked problems of our time. How can we use what we're collecting to help solve these problems? Um, you know, it, the stories are waiting to be found. Um, obviously our clients, you, our key government uh, agencies, they've all got diverse, diverse needs and capabilities. We've got our high-end users in Treasury that are just consuming con huge amounts of data. And then we've got our U6 math students that are um, coming to the website and going, oh dear, where do I start? Um, so obviously there's going to be high expectations around what we can provide and the ability to collaborate. Um, User-generated content, I mean, yes, we have um, uh, something called is it still called? No, it's Table Builder now. Um, yeah, we can allow you to come in and play around with uh, Table Builder using census data from, well, obviously the next one will be out in a week or two. Um, and actually create your own tables, create your own sources of information, mashing stuff together. Um, we also want to be able to provide that opportunity with external data, not just ABS data. Um, and there's also the geospatial component, obviously, all data in the ABS is collected based on your location, so we want to be able to provide that in a way that will help you provide re region relevant information. So obviously we've got some challenges around the ABS website, um, discovery, navigation and accessibility. Um, we also have um, a lot of techno babble on our website. So we need to train our content providers to write fit for purpose for the readers of all levels. Um, engaging content, it's not just spewing out data and, and assessments, it's trying to provide the information that you need rather than what we think you need. And better engage our external service providers, so actually pulling information in from other service providers like the AHW to try and meet some of those information gaps we may have. So this is where we move on to ABS Betaworks. This was something that was originally released to staff internally only. It was something that was developed on a Friday night after half a bottle of red. Um, 
worked. <laughs> so if, <laughs> yeah, effectively what happened was we thought, well, our web designers aren't the only ones with the ideas, so let's get the rest of the staff in on it. Uh, was a successful pilot, and that was when we decided in mid-2009 to release it to the whole of Australian public. And what it does is it combines RR&D with and web, web design with into audience intelligence. So um, we're not just blindly developing thinking, hoping that we're hitting the right mark. We're actually mushing a lot of intelligence together. So in regards to audience intelligence, we've got the direct feedback, so what we get from our users. Um, so surveys, we've also got um, Google Urchin using web analytics and our social media interaction. Um, we've developed some internal uh, market segmentation models and personas. Obviously, there's going to be lots of challenges and benefits. So we're reaching the right audiences, um, building capability. It's all well and good for us to put this information out there. How can we help you to know the right way to use it, um, know the right way to interpret it? So catering for that. Um, pretty much Betaworks fits into all bar the measuring part of the development process. So we, we, you know, we use Betaworks to understand, report, strategize, innovate, change. And for, it, there's, all through all that, there's the feedback that we get from you. What's in scope? Um, it's basically the way we deliver the content, the web design, the data visualizations, and any new online trends. We don't release any new data formats. It's not about, well, it is about the data, but it's not about the actual data itself. It's about the delivery of the data and how we can help you understand that. Increasing statistical literacy and creating open and transparent government. So effectively, what happened was in 2009, we, um, we released this, which was really clunky looking, and over a period of time, we've developed um, our skills in HTML5 and CSS3. So if you go to the, uh, the ABS Betaworks now, it'll do some really funky things. For the next one. So it'll look like this. Um, at the top, we've got some media calls and stuff, so it just looks a lot more whizzy. And then we've also got it set up so that if you look at it on a portable device, it'll resize itself to fit that screen size. Um, right, so next of all, we've got a couple of case studies. Um, the population pyramid, um, it was uh, originally developed in SVG and then when IE8 was released, uh, I, well, Microsoft went, yeah, we're not supporting SVG anymore, so we had to come up with a new way to, to um, provide the population pyramid. Um, one of my guys was a mad keen Flash developer, spent a lot of time working on it. Obviously SVG's back, so we now have got to go back to SVG, but um, it just enabled us to um, improve the process of updating it as well. So when, when it was in SVG originally, it was really clunky to update. It took months to get the new data into it. Now it's just a matter of updating an XML file and off we go. So um, if you want to um, skip to the next one. Um, yeah, so I went from this, um, we got a lot of, we put it up saying, okay, well, what, what do you want to see from it? This was the, the original Flash version. We got some really good feedback on it. And then we went to the next version, which was a lot tidier and had a lot more options to play with. So the next version we've got looking at is playing around with D3. We don't know whether it'll work or not, but we can at least put it up on Betaworks and find out whether anyone wants us to continue with that. Um, what's next? The iPhone app. Yeah, this is exciting. This has been going since 2009. <laughs> it's, uh, it's this close. Um, effectively, we originally started this idea because we all got iPhones in the team and thought, ooh, this is really cool, wonder what we can do. But before we did that, we put out some, just some screenshots on Betaworks, got some, I made it click through, just a heap of image maps worked really well, got a lot of really good feedback on it. Um, we also need time to develop a capability in-house because we just don't have the money to spend on big developments like this. Um, so one of my guys, Dave, has been working feverishly on it and the execs come in and go, ooh, what do we, we, we do that? So then a bit more coding going. Um, so we're hoping to have it out by the end of July at the very latest. Um, just depending on how things go, but um, if you flip to the first screen, um, that's how the actual image map looked originally. Uh, it was just all done in Photoshop, and then we got the feedback from it, saying, okay, well, when, when can we download it? 
and now we've got it going and scraping um, the census data, data packs, so that we can provide, um, it's obviously going to be the census data, so it won't be up to date, but there's other parts of the app for that. Um, so, um, basically, all I can say is give us your feedback. Um, we, we can't do it without you. Um, spread the word. We're on, um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Google+. We want, we want to know what everyone thinks. Um, we did actually get um, nominated and was a finalist in the 2011 Excellence in the Governments Awards. Um, I did get up on stage for that. <laughs> it was fun, yeah. So, photo of the award, photo of me on stage. And just to close up, there I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so Betaworks is really easy to find. Just go um, at betaworks.abs.gov.au. Um, Twitter, your ABS. We're happy to talk any time. Feel free to leave as much feedback as you want. Constructive, deconstructive, we're happy. <laughs> and then in general, the ABS is online, obviously. Um, we've got our website and then we're in Facebook, Twitter, and we've just recently forwarded into Google+. Plus. So um, basically, that's about it. Um, if there's any questions, I'm sure they'll be coming soon. Yeah, nothing wrong with a bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, all right, we've got about 10 minutes, if we eat into coffee time a little bit, for questions, and I think... No, I can't detach that. So, any questions of our panel? With regard to the Centrelink use site, um, particularly Facebook, the... Um, timeline design I found with one that I manage has made it very difficult to get users interacting with each other from their own posts because of the way that it almost hides posts by others. Are you experiencing that sort of problem with your Facebook page as well, getting things going? Have you got any ideas how to get around that other than lobbying <laughs> Facebook? <laughs> So is this in terms of, um, so not so much users interacting with our posts, but interacting with posts that other people have done? Yeah, building a sort of a, an interactive community between themselves, as opposed to you having to lead everything. Um, no, we haven't, to be honest. Um, there's, yeah, thinking offhand, there's definitely been, we, this was something that we thought about, that it could be a problem initially, but no, we still have people interacting with each other through their own posts and through ours. Um, one possible suggestion is, and we haven't looked into this because we haven't needed to yet, but you can actually tag posts so that they stay up the top. There is a flagging, I think it is. Um, so that, that was worth that, investigating. Uh, John Hilbert, IT News. Uh, question for, for the, uh, uh, from the Office of Spatial Policy. Uh, we recently ran a story uh, on why NBN was being delayed, and one of the uh, issues that was put to, to us uh, at Estimates was the integrity or the factual, uh, yeah, actual um, reliability of the data had slowed down the rollout of uh, the NBN. Did you want to comment on what you're doing uh, to uh, respond to those issues? Uh, yes, certainly. A um, couple of things I'd like to say about that. Um, if you refer to Hansard, um, what was discussed uh, in Parliament was actually, um, I think, taken a little bit uh, out of context. Um, there are some uh, issues around the geocoded national address framework, the GNAF. Um, and NBN is helping uh, PSMA, the Public Sector Mapping Agency, to address those issues. The key thing is um, that the GNAF is not fit for purpose for what the NBN is doing, and the reason for that is that um, it doesn't contain um, addresses 
to a level where uh, there are gated communities or there is a building with multiple storeys or there are multiple um, dwellings in one location. Um, how the address framework um, comes together is very complicated um, and part of the reason uh, that we are seeking to uh, have a whole of government licence for the GNAF is because it is the best source of address data there is. Um, it pulls together uh, Australia Post information, um, it pulls together Centrelink information, um, it uh, then pulls uh, all the land information from the various jurisdictions in the states, um, and then that's aggregated. And if you have a look at uh, the detail around the GNAF, 90% uh, of it is correct, um, but there is some element uh, that uh, that is causing the NBN a little bit of, of grief, and we understand that. Um, but certainly, um, there is no better uh, geocoded national address file than the GNAF currently. Um, and the uh, work done by NBN in feeding into the GNAF those errors um, is then being fed back to the jurisdictions for, um, for rechecking, recalibrating, and ultimately the NBN will give us a geocoded national address file that is very, very accurate. Carrie Hilliard, question for Adam. Um, I just wondered if you'd been involved in the, uh, got involved with Avcal because they've, those, the private equity industry's been doing a lot with social venturing um, and there may be not only money but expertise there that you could harness. Uh, thanks for that uh, comment. No, we haven't, to, um, to be blunt. We're not actually developing the financial products themselves for the CEDA, but something that the fund managers have a responsibility for, uh, but we'd be very open to, to having a conversation because the equity type products, whether they be equity or quasi equity, are something that would be extremely innovative. We And there are certain challenges that social enterprises face in their company structures which need to be factored in for equity type investments. So um, I'd be delighted to come and have a chat with you afterwards and get some further details. Thank you. Just a question for Carolyn of DHS. You mentioned that uh, your forays into social media and web forums were reducing the pressure on the call centers. And I was wondering if you could talk about any information you might have about the cost implications of having to put money into providing moderators, but then reducing pressure on your call centers. Um, I actually mentioned that we, have, that we believe that it is, and we would like to think that it is reducing pressure on the cost of call centres, but we don't actually have any data on that yet. Um, that, and that's something that we're working on. Um, we're really, really keen to show evidence of, yeah. Um, at, at the moment, it's funded more through working with sort of different business teams to implement their strategies. Um, but yeah, we're really working hard with, with business to try and work out a way to show evidence. Um, and we, we really think that it's possible. For example, um, some data that we got from um, the call centre recently on calls in the youth and students area. I don't, this is, I don't remember exactly what the data was, but there was something like 15 or 20% of calls to the youth and students line was about how to apply for youth allowance. All of this information is on our website. Absolutely everything. Um, you look, the information's online, you apply online, and then after that you have to go into the customer service centres to put in your documentation. So, I mean, if, and I think there was probably another 15% of the calls were report, like regarding reporting income, which again is all online. So even though we don't actually have that data yet, we believe that if you look at the breakdown of the calls, there's a lot of evidence to show that if we can get out there into social media and direct people more successfully in that way, then it will have a really big cost impact. Thank you. 
on our business. Hi, uh, Damien Patterson from Dewa. My question is for Lockie. Uh, a couple of questions actually, Lockie. Can you um, tell us a little bit more about how you came come to be uh, mashing up government data and building iPhone apps? Um, so a little bit more maybe about how you actually came to be an iPad application developer. Uh, where did you learn those skills? Did you learn them more at school or on your own? And the final question is, do you really think you still need to go to school? <laughs> Um, well, I learnt, I do it as a school subject, uh, he's my teacher, uh, so that's where I learnt most of the skills. Um, that's basically, it, it's, you can find a lot of this stuff if you want to get into it yourself online, there's huge amounts of resources, um, definitely a very easy thing to find learning stuff on, but most of it's come from my teacher, um, and it's just something that I'm interested in. And it doesn't actually take as many skills as some people think to build something great. Um, oh, don't talk it down. Yeah, and I think I still need to go to school. So. <laughs> we'll negotiate a price. <laughs> uh, my question sort of links on from the saving the money uh, of uh, managing the youth questions to the ABS idea of the data. Um, the, the census, I really enjoyed the census Twitter account. I, uh, I loved it, it had a sense of humour and it seemed to work very well. I'm just wondering if you could if perhaps talk a little, do you have uh, the background to talk a little bit about that and how it may have fitted into the work you're doing now? Or not? Luckily, maybe for me, it wasn't part of my team that <laughs> did that. Um, that was actually managed by the Census PR team. They had a dedicated group of people that managed it. Um, I do know that they're planning to resurrect it for a little while uh, as part of the release of the actual data in the next month. Um, but as for the plans for it, I can't tell you. I just would like to suggest that once the census component winds down that you Spit across and follow ABS stats instead, because <laughs> we will continue to can pu push stuff out through that way. Okay, we've probably got time for one more quick question. Anybody? Okay, uh, thank you very much to our panelists. I, th I think take and looked at uh, together. I mean, it shows that uh, innovation's quite uh, quite healthy in the APS and probably. Uh, I detect a hint of we need to be a bit more out there in promoting ourselves. Um, so thank you very much. We do have some chocolates for you. That's, the, that's what the budget ran to. Uh, morning tea now, then the academic panel. And one second. And one more announcement. Um, just uh, very quickly before we head off to lunch. Um, so as Steve said, so toilets around here, morning tea out here. Um, the, please make sure your phones are turned off. We forgot to say that at the beginning. Please make sure that over the morning tea break, we want to see some unconference sessions. So you've got 12 sessions up there. Um, at least six of you should be brave enough to put your hands up and say something cool. David Ead, I'm looking at you to talk about what's happening in Queensland. And I will pick other volunteers, you know, <laughs> one at a time every hour until it's all full. Okay. Um, <laughs> So um, finally, I, I actually had not yet acknowledged our sponsors, and that's kind of a bad thing. So I should probably do that. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, run through them. Is that possible to flick to those slides? He didn't tell you, he didn't tell you. So I'm going to do them off the top of my head. Uh, first of all, we have seven departments and agencies. I could just browse up and down there, but I can't right now. You'll do that for me. Thank you, Jeff. Because we're agile, that's right. We're, we respond to change, we're resilient. We're exactly what you need to do, not quite. So Adobe, MailChimp and Palantir are our gold sponsors. A huge thank you to them. Uh, Cisco, Google, Ninefold, CSIRO and the e-government technology cluster all came on as silver sponsors. Our in-kind sponsors, um, Atlassian actually provide support for the GovHack. Link Digital, who went above and beyond with our website and support, particularly over the GovHack, uh, supporting teams to register and such. 
Um, Mob did an AR augmented reality thing through GovHack. Newcast, who are doing just an incredible job doing our live streaming uh, just over here, um, and are just amazing. We've got four cameras going, and it all looks very professional to the people watching out there online. Hi, guys. Um, and Salesforce are doing um, social media coverage. Uh, University of Canberra, isn't this the most wonderful space ever? Gov2 Radio are doing coverage, interviews, and um, talking to our speakers and sponsors. Webcast Cloud, we're helping with some streaming. And of course, the organizers, in case you haven't figured it out yet, are a bunch of volunteers. So they're the, a whole bunch of people from the Gov2 community. Half of us are public servants. So anytime someone says public servants are lazy, I tend to slap them. Um, Rewired State help with the Gov hack, but they're not involved in this, and the e-government technology cluster. And of course, this is all part of Innovation Week, and the Department of Innovation are involved in today with the Academic Forum. Um, please enjoy morning tea. Uh, we'll be back here to start promptly at the starting time of 11 o'clock, so um, please enjoy. Thank you.